Welcome back, friends, to another Sunday Soundpost episode on Kentucky Small Batch Strings. I'm your host, Greg Marcy. Uh, I just wanted to tell you about this fiddle I'm working on today. Uh, it belongs to a friend of mine, Mr. Brandon Ward. He's the bass player of uh, the band I'm in, Punch and Creek. And we're calling this fiddle the fiddle that crossed the line. As I'm trying to show you in here, and I'll cut away to a picture here, that um, inside this fiddle is an interesting label. It says, copy of an Antonio Stradivarius made in Czechoslovakia. It's printed. And then it is stamped over top, made in Germany. Now, it is my belief that this is one of the early fiddles of uh, probably around 1920s, 1930s era. It doesn't look to be that old. Somewhere close to maybe the 100-year mark. The great thing about these fiddles is they historically show what some of these businesses had to do to meet the demands of other businesses in Europe and America. It was a really interesting time for these businesses to reach out to different countries. Dag schmabbit. Did I just do that? I'd actually play the audio here, but I said something far worse than dag schmabbit. Let me explain what happened. Doodle in a bridge, doodle in a bridge, drawing out the bridge. Okay, so if you notice my grain lines are running, the angle of the marks I have of going across it there, uh, you can see there I have my knife blade angle, and boom, I chipped out a huge old chunk, which made tears come from my eyes. And I screamed no, and other words that I won't mention on this channel, because they're not appropriate. Doodle in a bridge, doodle in a bridge, drawing up a bridge and a doodle. Okay, so this time when I come at this angle, I want to pay attention to what the grain is. And I'm going to approach it from the opposite angle, as not to catch the end of a grain and tear it out. So that's what I learned this time. Make sure I'm approaching it from not the end of a grain, so that I can not chip it out and yay life will be better so there i am uh, i'm sorry greg continue <laughs> Now one thing I've left out of this second bridge is the fact that I've already done some knife work to the feet. I kind of do a hybrid of this and the foot sanding in the um, bridge jig that I'm using here because it seems to speed up the work of just using the bridge jig. Also it, uh, it really perfectly fits the feet to the top of the instrument. There's the top of my head. At least it's not the back. Every time I see it, I think of an old 80s toy. See if you guys remember having this toy around your house. It's Munchie Chi, girl doll, boy doll. School time and football fan outfits are each sold separately. Munchie Chi, Munchie Chi, oh so soft and cuddly. Happy, happy Munchie Chi. I love you, Munchie Chi. Now, I have to give credit where credit is due, so um, I'd like to thank Zara for showing me this technique at Old Town Violin when I shadowed them one day. Um, so it really works as far as getting those feet really nice and uh, arched according to the bridge. I had done was get the thickness of those feet just a little bit smaller. Uh, I like to get them around one millimeter to like a millimeter and a half. Really, really thin. But um, I also didn't trim the ankles as thin as I should because uh, I'm aware that this fiddle isn't going to be played much. The, band, the bass player of my band, Brandon Warren, is the owner of it and um, no offense to him. It's mostly just going to be staying in a case or it's not going to be played aggressively and often so I figured it was structurally more important to make it a little bit sturdier than going for the finer detail. Plus 
at this point it was about one o'clock in the morning and I was exhausted. I was on my second bridge of the day and um, I had just downright had it now. One tool I'm very glad I bought was a bridge jack that you'll see me here use in a minute. The reason why I'm glad I bought that is because I've done this work before and it's so much easier if you can leave some tension on the strings while you're working on it and the bridge jack allows you to do that and keeps that string height while you are making small adjustments on your bridge, you know, taking down a millimeter or two at a time and that way you, you don't get frustrated and take too much off. So I'm very, very glad I purchased that. It also makes it easier as far as string spacing where you're trying to get that right with the bridge on the instrument. As promised, this time I'm going to pay attention to the grain, make sure I'm not carving it from the wrong side. I need to make sure I flip it over when I get to a spot that the grain is going to be going parallel with the top to make sure I don't snag that in grain and do a big tear out like I did last time. Did I seriously just cut a big stupid chunk out of that again? Arrgh. Well, luckily enough, I think it's still within the realm of saving it. I'm going to trim it down a little further and see what I can get. But now I'm really, really promising you I will pay better attention. One thing I don't do, because everybody expects me to, because I'm a fiddle player, everybody asks, do you make your bridges a little bit flatter? No. I stick with the traditional 3.5 millimeter on the E string and 5.5 millimeter on the G string side, and I follow that arch uh, that kind of gets heavy between G and D. Um, you know, there's different schools of thought on what well, makes a fiddle a fiddle and violin a violin. I say structurally, they need to try to be the same instrument. Um, you know, I'm, I'm of the idea that no matter what you play, be it violin style, fiddle style, whatever you want to call it, that it needs to be set up to the player's specifications. And if somebody wanted a flatter bridge, I'd give it to them, but I would highly recommend trying to adapt to more of a traditional violin setting just because it's gonna it's gonna be easier if you decide you want to try a different fiddle someday or violin or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I'm gonna use the two interchangeable. So if you hear me using it, it's just gonna be for that purpose. Now one thing I'm doing here is shaping the end pin or the end button uh, that holds the tail gap on for the tail piece. Um, the old one was cracked and had some damage to it, so I went ahead and replaced it. Now, per our usual segment in this part of the video. Uh, I'm going to 
turned it over to an interview that I did with my old orchestra teacher, or at least part of an interview. Someday I may uh, do the whole interview for you, but this is um, a good story from Mr. Merle Reisner about the first violin he ever owned, and uh, I'll just give it a listen. My dad could play a little bit. He played a little bit. Uh, uh, let me see. I had a cousin I thought to mention to you, Paul Robbins. He got to, he was got to play in bluegrass, and the first thing I can remember about actually playing, he sent for me, uh, sent me word to come down to his house and bring my fiddle. He lived a mile away, and I walked down there with my fiddle, and here's a good one. I was, <laughs> he had a little stinking mean little girl sister. I walked by and she said, well, what do you got there? I said, well, it's a fiddle. She said, well, let me see it. I said, no. My dad had told me, don't you? He said, first of all, he said, don't take it down there. He said, you'll get it broken. I said, I will guard this fiddle. Nobody will touch this fiddle. And she said, let me see that fiddle. I said, you no, I've told my dad, nobody's touching this fiddle. She said, well, I want to see it. Now, of course, you know, we argued a little bit, and she ran up the hill and picked up a rock and threw it at me. And I laughed. I thought, you can't hit me. Well, she didn't hit me. I ducked. Uh -huh. I, forgot, I forgot to duck my fiddle. <laughs> if I'd known if I had it to do over, I'd let her knock my brains out for it, hadn't I? <laughs> she broke that fiddle and had a crack. It carried a crack, and I tried and tried to fix it. You, get, you can't hardly, you know, it's difficult to fix a crack in a fiddle. Oh yeah. I'm a kid anyway, so I never, I never didn't get it fixed. Yeah. That's uh. Oh, I bet, I bet that about broke your heart though. Oh man, I went home crying. Yeah, I, <laughs> I couldn't stand it. <laughs> Dad, he just kind of sniffed and snorted a little bit. He didn't say anything other than maybe, well, I told you not to take it down there. You know? <laughs> that don't help, does it? <laughs> no.